Okay. So this is another one of my pop culture road shows where I look at some of the items that I have from all of the toys and vintage pop culture things that I've collected over the years and try to find out a little something more about them. Maybe a little history, a little art background, a little something. Twinkie the Kid. Now, what I have here, getting past the fact that in 2001, Twinkie made a personal Twinkie holder for kids. So you would put a Twinkie in here. Now, if I'm not mistaken, Twinkies come in packs of two. They're already kind of something that you can carry with you because they're wrapped. They have the cardboard backing. No, you don't think so? No, they're not. They come in pairs. My wife thinks that they come individually. I say they come in pairs. They come in two Twinkies. That is what I think. They do come wrapped. So um, giving, getting them their own holster, while it is neat, I mean, I enjoy it. Look at this thing. It's got hands for crying out loud. So this was in 2001 that this thing was made and it was of Twinkie the Kid. Um, also, I just want to state too, it was in 2001 and on the back, it has the website on there, which believe it or not, 2001 in internet years, is like a million years ago. Like that, not every company had websites. What I also wanted to know about was the mascot of Twinkie the Kid himself. Now, I looked that up and Twinkie the Kid was the, the mascot was created in 1971 and uh he was dressed like a cowboy, 10 gallon hat, kerchief, cowboy boots. Cause if you're going to be a cowboy in the commercials, they also had the other characters where there was captain cupcake and there was fruit pie, the magician. Those are the other two people that he would, these were animated. Of course they were cartoon animated segments that were done. One of the commercials that they had, uh, Twinkie, the kids saved Twinkie Town. So they created an entire town that was named after him as well. Twinkie Town. I would love to know if there's actually a Twinkie Town anywhere in the world. That would be kind of funny. Won't you take me to Twinkie Town? That, that would have been the song. In 1999, here's a funny fact. President Bill Clinton uh, actually put a Twinkie inside of the nation's millennium capsule for something that's going to be open years from now. And uh, he said, because it is an enduring American icon. Now, the other thing too, is the voice of Twinkie the Kid in those commercials was a person by the name of Alan Swift. Alan's name was uh, Ira Stadlin. Uh, he was known professionally as Alan Swift because he took his name from a mixture of two things. He liked uh, Fred Allen, was one of his uh, favorite entertainers. And also he liked the author, uh, Jonathan Swift. So he made a mixture of the name and came up with Alan Swift. And Jonathan Swift is the person who wrote Gulliver's Travels. And he was uh, the host of a show that was called The Popeye Show. Self-explanatory. That was in 1956. And he also provided a majority of the voices on the Rankin and Bass Mad Monster Party. And it's about a bunch of like, Frankenstein and Dracula and they all live in a house together and they have a party and it was just like the whole Rankin and Bass like Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer thing only it was for Halloween and I even didn't know about it until a few years ago so it's not as widely known he also did the voice of Howdy Doody but how he did the voice for Howdy Doody was because Howdy Doody was originally voiced or was always voiced by uh Captain Buffalo Bob is is who it was and he always did it. And he's like, nobody would ever be able to do Howdy Doody's voice. Then Buffalo Bob had a heart attack. Alan Swift was one of the voices of one of the other puppets on the show. And he went home and studied the voice and came back. And for the remainder of the year that the show was still supposed to be on the air, he did the voice of Howdy Doody. That is what I learned about Twinkie the Kid, or at least the random facts that kind of led me down that rabbit hole about Twinkies and Twinkie the Kid. Oh, and Alan Swift did the voice of a talking drain in Drano commercials on television. There's that too. So I have a bunch of Heathcliff books, but what I mainly know 
the subject I'm going to talk about is the Heathcliff animated show that was really popular in the 80s. And it was on around the same time as the Inspector Gadget cartoon. So the 80s Heathcliff series debuted in 1984. It has its own look and feel. Not like the original, like it does not, the Heathcliff cartoon does not look like these characters. Like it's just different. They were outsourced to uh, Japanese, Taiwanese, and Korean studios, uh, which was very, and still is very common. And so was Inspector Gadget and all that stuff. Mel Blanc did the voice of Heathcliff on the animated series. So it wasn't just Heathcliff. It was Heathcliff and Riff Raff and the Cadillac Cats. I think it was. I didn't care for that one as much. So Heathcliff was, first of all, often thought of as a ripoff of Garfield. When in reality, and these books kind of prove that too, Heathcliff came out eight years before Garfield ever did. It, came, uh, it premiered in 1973 and Garfield didn't show up in newspapers until 1978. The person who drew it was, uh, he studied at Pratt Institute. After graduating, he worked at an advertising agency for 11 years, but he did not care for commercial art. So uh, his older brother was a cartoonist. So he decided that he was going to enter the cartoon field as well. So in 1957, he sold his very first comic. He dropped his last name because he's like, I'm going to be a cartoonist now, but his brother was already doing it. So he dropped his last name so people wouldn't confuse them. So he went by his middle name, which was Gately. So that's how he became George Gately instead of George Gately Gallagher. So then in 1964, he actually had his first comic strip and it was called Hapless Harry. And it was a very hippie centric uh, cartoon saying hippie terms and, you know, freaking out the squares. It's like on the Beverly Hillbillies when they used to have a hippie show up and he'd be dressed a certain way with the fur vest. It's kind of what the cartoon was like. So that ran for several years. But then in 1973, uh, he drew a fat orange cat pitched it and Heathcliff uh, became an enormous success. And a lot of the stuff he did was one panel comics to keep up with demand. He recruited Bob Laughlin and then also his brother. So his brother then now worked for him. The person that inspired him to go into cartoons ended up working for him and he hired them to help draw daily strips and keep up with the pace of then doing Sunday color pages, all that kind of stuff. So that is what I learned about Heathcliff. I have these little big books, but on occasion they will have this thing on there that says, uh, flip it cartoons, see move. Now I know my friends and I used to love it when we would get a big book that was paperback in the library because we would draw our own cartoons in them and flip the pages and it would be somebody flipping around or a car crash or somebody jumping. It would always be very violent, but it was stick figures. Well, these are, are books that are stories where it's an actual novel, but each page is illustrated with the character it's about. Like, here's one about Pink Panther. Here's another one with Bugs Bunny. And it would follow, you know, have all these drawings and stuff next to full-on story. Here's another one with Bugs Bunny uh, in a castle. But as you see up here in the corner, there's a little section that was marked off by a square. And it's on all of these. And they were called... Flip it cartoons. So they were books that came pre-made with animated stuff. You can see there. Woo. And the fun thing too, being a person who wanted to make cartoons, uh, what I loved about them is I could look at them and go, how would they animate that? And then I would look at each frame and go, what's the next one? And I would try and redraw those myself and try and get the movement and the motion and the squash and there's another one. I could just sit here and flip these all day and not even talk. That's kind of fun. The uh, first known record of somebody who uh, created actual flip it books was a man by the name of John Barnes Linnet. He was born in 1831 and he was a British lithographer and uh, lived in Birmingham, England. He has the oldest known documentation of the flip book. So 
he actually registered it. That's why it's known as the oldest one. He, he decided to patent the flip book. Who knows if he got the idea from someone else, but um, he did that in 1868. It was under the name, uh, the kinograph or moving picture. So what they were is they were books, but it was a machine that would flip the book like, Oh, I should do it this way. That would flip the book for you. And you would look at it. So it was, it was something mechanical and they'd flop down and that's how you would see it in 1834 or I'm sorry, 1894, 34. Gee, I'm going back in time. He took his time machine and went to go talk. No. In 1894, uh, Herman Kassler invented a mechanized form of the flip book called uh, the mutoscope. He mounted pages on a central rotating cylinder rather than binding them in a book. So he put them in a cylinder. So it was kind of like, what are those card catalogs for phone numbers? Rolodex. Rolodex. It's like, it was kind of like a Rolodex but it had metal sheets and it would flip that way. And that's how you would see it. It was a popular attraction. Like he made them so that they were coin operated and people could pay to actually see these in penny arcades and amusement parks and stuff like that. Then Herman Kessler helped develop a portable one instead of, cause so it was a big bulky machine and it was, uh, it was mechanical. So he invented one that was smaller that could be put in more places that was hand cranked. And uh, he came out with that in uh, 1900. So that way he could fit it into smaller spaces, put it in more places. It wasn't as expensive to do. And it would replace the motor operated camera. Then he helped uh, John Pross to develop a three blade projector shutter also to help reduce flickers. So while messing with these animated flip things, they also kind of helped the process and the innovation of filmmaking and projecting and all that kind of stuff itself. So that's what I learned by looking up flip it books in the cartoons or flip it cartoons in these books here in the little big book series or big little book series. As I always forget what they're called. That is what I have. Those are the things that I found out today about some of these items. Um, don't forget to go to my website, tommarieswebsite.com, and you can check out all of these items and more that I have in my eBay store in the link on the site. So until next time, I will see you around. That kind of stuff. All right, now I'm going to